Everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap of the Week. There's a lot of rumors this week to cover, but also a good amount of actual just hardware, physical hardware news. Uh, first of all, on the rumor side, the 5090 and 5080 get some rumored specifications. The 9950X3D and 9900X3D are reportedly going to use both CCDs with vCache rather than just one which might solve some of the sort of scheduling and special setup considerations that uh, have existed in the past, like for the 7950X3D. On the news side, Intel is once again addressing its issues with 13th and 14th gen stability with, it's definitely the, the fixed one this time, microcode. So we'll be talking about that, some of the changes that they're uh, talking about there. 4090 price is going up in Germany and Valve experimenting with ARM64. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lian Lee and the O11D Evo RGB case. The O11D Evo RGB is an updated entry to the famed O11 lineup, retaining heavy support for fan mounts, drive mount locations, and flexibility on component mounting, such as two options for the power supply. The O11D Evo RGB's dual chamber approach aims to maximize cable storage on the backside to streamline cable management. Coupling this with a unique vertical GPU mount to showcase the most expensive part in most systems. Learn more at the link in the description below. First, a really quick update on the GN side. So we posted our Fab Tour documentary. Like I said in the, the news episode last week, you can check that out for more detail on some of the nuance for this. But uh, despite the issues that we still have with Intel's 13th and 14th gen handling and how I think you know, they're kind of acting in bad faith and a lot of their communications for that. We have a whole separate video on that. The Fab is a separate thing. We filmed it a year ago, finally got it all put together. It's live on the channel. Check it out if you haven't seen it. And uh, so far the reception has been really positive. So thank you all for checking it out, giving it a shot because it's a fun format for us. I really like doing factory tours because I learn a lot from them. Uh, those are environments where we normally get to talk to people who truly are experts in things that, uh, at least for me on the team, uh, I personally have no idea about before walking through the door. So they're really fun videos to do because our format is basically, let's put a, a mic on me, a mic on the uh, the expert, if there's uh, multiple, then great. And basically just ask them questions and learn from them while we walk around the place. And it worked out really well. So if you want to learn about fabrication and wafer production, check that video out. And uh, I'm, I'm happy with how it came out. So really glad to be done with that video. It was over a year in the making for that one. But anyway, with that, we launched this shirt. If you want to pre-order it, it's on the store, on store.gamersnexus.net. Or if you just want to buy one that's in stock, we have the Cyber Skeleton V2 shirt that is in stock and shipping. There's not many of them left. Uh, some of the sizes, I think, are out of stock already. But those are in the store. And this one's up for pre-order, which we do because we collect sort of the quantity we need to order if it's going to be uh, a special production run. So this is a foil skeleton style shirt, and it uses the factory components from different factories we've toured over the years. The intent of the shirt is to help fund our factory tour series and our documentaries we produce because they are massive efforts, uh, very expensive for us to do. We cover all of our own travel for that stuff. And uh, it's, I mean, really just do it because I think they're important and fun videos. Um, and then we launch these things to try and help pay for them. So if you want to support that video directly, then buying a shirt like this will help show that support. And honestly, if you can't afford it or you don't need a shirt, that's totally fine with me. Even just watching parts of the video would be enough to make me happy. <laughs> so as for the shirt, it's got some foops on it. So the front opening unified pods that you saw up on the ceiling in the fab tour, we put those on the shirt and the design as part of the rib cage. And the back's got VRM components on it. So check that out on store.gamersaccess.net or just check out the video. And let's get into the first story. All right, first up, rumors of the 5090 and 5080 cards again. But now it's starting to get a little more concrete. So noted hardware leaker copite 7 kimmy recently shared some supposed leaks for the upcoming RTX 50 series cards. These are just rumors at this point. They're not yet verified. We're going to talk about them anyway, just because stuff's starting to firm up, and then we can look back and see how accurate they were later. So, starting with the 5090, NVIDIA's anticipated flagship consumer card will reportedly be a 600-watt GPU. Uh, we're going to come back to that number, uh, which will use a 512-bit memory bus and 32 gigabytes of GDDR7 memory. It supposedly uses the GB202300A1 GPU and features 21,760 FP32 cores. Despite being a supposed 600-watt card, which is 150 watts more than the advertised uh, TGP of the 4090, the leaker says that the card will, perhaps surprisingly, use a two-slot cooler solution. So this is an area where we think something might be getting mixed up here. It's possible that uh, the power number is wrong. It's possible that the expectation is just mixed up of what we think uh, this type of card 
is supposed to be, or it's possible that the rumor is mixed up with something, only because two slots seems impossibly small for 600 watts. Now, it is possible to do two slots of cooling on 600 watts if it's liquid or if it is uh, maybe forced air input in a server type setup where you've got these super high RPM fans just force feeding air through a server chassis or something. Now, maybe NVIDIA has some insane marvel of cooling engineering. That would certainly be exciting to cover, and we'd be happy to cover it. It does, however, seem like something here is a little bit off unless it's not intended to be a true 4090 replacement and it's something else entirely. So anyway, we'll find out what all that means. But far too early to speculate on the various ways it could or couldn't be true. Uh, the specs, though, if they are correct, would show an increase in CUDA cores substantially for the 5090 from 16,384 on the 4090 to this new 20 plus thousand, uh, 21,760 number for the rumored 5090. Now, CUDA cores are also not necessarily like for like. Depends generationally with architectural changes. Typically, they are not. And so, in that way, the improvement would be nonlinear. So, uh, it, it's possible that they make some changes to the SMs, to the CUDA cores in a way that makes the math a little fuzzy and we'll just have to wait to actually benchmark it. Either way, the 600 watt number is another thing to pay attention to. So in the past, for the uh, prior generation, there were rumors ahead of launch about 600 or 800 watt cards. None of these came to be true for the 4090 as we know it. Uh, and one of the things that I later learned is that sometimes these numbers are referring to the uh, total cooling capacity that NVIDIA is advising partners to design for, meaning the cooler should be able to sustain that much rather than the GPU itself. So uh, anyway, the, the point is that with rumors, we're not taking it at face value and we'll see um, how it pans out. So the 5080, on the other hand, will reportedly be a 400 watt card that leverages a 256 bit memory bus and 16 gigabytes of memory. The memory capacity here would be about the same as a 4080, but uh, the move to GDDR7 as opposed to GDDR6X would be a substantial change. It supposedly will use the GB203 400 A1 die and offer 10,752 cores if these specs are true. Compared to the 4080 before it, that would represent a 25% increase in advertised TGP up from 320 watts on the 4080. Now, there's just some commentary. So th this is the real reason this story is in here. The biggest change in all this might just be how NVIDIA positions these devices in the stack. So the 4090, uh, we know from speaking with anonymous people at NVIDIA uh, back when it launched, was wildly successful beyond what they expected for the mainstream consumer launch of the card. And this was after sort of the biggest mining boom, and the 4090 has remained popular throughout its lifespan. Some of that is because NVIDIA has finally managed to push a top tier card substantially ahead of the next card down in the ranks. That was not always the case. Uh, a lot of times in the past, we'd review things where it'd be like $400 more for an extra 4% performance. And so they managed to break free of that by segmenting them differently. And the point is that it's possible NVIDIA is positioning this so-called 5090 as more of a prosumer card going forward or some type of like local AI type of crunching card where with that memory capacity and these numbers we're talking about and the power we're talking about, it could just be something that really pushes the MSRP way up and sort of classes itself outside of top tier gaming performance and really commits to prosumer. So as an example, for our workstations here, when we edit videos, we basically only use cards like the 3090, 3090 Ti, or the 4090. The reason we don't use 4080s, for example, is because of the memory. It's specifically that reason where actually a 3090 or a 3090 Ti does better for our workloads because we fully saturate the VRAM than the 4080 would. And uh, if they're committing more to that, where you're segmenting out those prosumers into a different category of device, uh, kind of separate from what Quadro has historically done, then that might be what we're seeing here is a, sort of doubling down on that commitment with 5090. Anyway, that's just some commentary for me. So uh, the next story is sort of a follow-up to the rumor we reported on last week about NVIDIA potentially winding down the 4090 production. There were discussions of potentially discontinuation of the 4090 cards. 3dcenter.org reports that the prices for the flagship Ada Lovelace cards uh, have increased over time in Germany. The 4090 launched at 1,949 euros in the country back in October 2022, according to 3D Center. The card reportedly dropped to a low of 1,590 euros uh, back in August of 2023, and now has come back to soar above its original launch price. 
3dcenter.org tweeted an image highlighting how nearly all of retailer Case Kane's 4090 stock is out, with the exception of an Asus ROG Strix white variant, which features an inflated price of 2,300 euros. We also quickly checked Newegg for US pricing and found that most of the models that are sold and shipped by Newegg and are new are around or above $1,900 now, where some of these were closer to that $1,700 range last year. But it just really depends on when you check, because there were periods in the last year where the prices were briefly really high as well. So, all right, Valve may be experimenting with ARM64 support. In an update to Valve test app 3043620 on SteamDB, which is a site that's not affiliated with Valve officially, we can see hundreds of mentions of the term Proton Arm 64 ec next to hundreds of Steam titles that include Left 4 Dead 2, Gary's Mod, Kerbal Space Program, Spelunky, and more. Proton is the compatibility layer that Valve uses, such as on SteamOS, for compatibility to allow Windows games to run on Linux. Now, in Proton, with Valve using it for the Steam Deck, for example, we've even seen some improvements sometimes where, although there's a more limited range of total compatibility, we've also seen better frame time pacing in some titles. So it's an interesting solution in general for that reason, where sometimes it's it's not like a, just a second-class citizen, kind of like the old uh, playing games through Wine on Linux previously. It's actually uh, very robust now. So anyway, ARM64 is a 64-bit instruction set that's commonly used in mobile devices like smartphones and tablets. Pairing these together points to the possibility that Valve may be experimenting with getting Steam games, which typically run on x86 on PC, running on mobile-centric hardware. If Valve is successful here, it could point to the possibility of users playing Steam games on a growing pool of non-X86 devices. It could also open the door for Valve to make another portable gaming console beyond the Steam Deck, maybe something a little bit different in its execution. Up next, John Petty Research, or JPR, has released its latest report of market share distribution and uh, its report on AIB, or add-in board and add-in card devices in the market. So total AIB shipments, JPR says, have increased 9% in quarter two versus quarter one, where typically the second quarter is flat or down as compared to the first. The interesting point, though, is going to be on Intel, which we'll get to in a second. So JPR stated this, quote, the add-in board market continues to surprise and astonish market watchers who've been predicting its doom for decades. Okay, with one little dip in Q1, seasonally normal, we've seen four quarters of growth, end quote. Shipments were also up 48% year over year, according to JPR, which is huge percentage-wise, but is also more of a recovery to the levels reported in quarter one of 2019 and 2020. There was, of course, a large overall surge from the second half of 2020 through early 2022, and then a subsequent crash from then through 2023. Between this and the high attach rate, it's looking like things are getting back to normal, whatever that means at this point, for the PC market. Uh, not quite back to 2017 era heights, but that was also a time when crypto mining was playing a massive role in the GPU market specifically, so a little bit fuzzy because of that. Either way though, uh, JPR also published a market share graph, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. Despite more GPUs shipping, Intel isn't getting any of the business based on these numbers. Its ARC GPUs were at a 2% share in quarter two 2023, but they've since dropped low enough for JPR to report it simply as 0%. Now to reduce like this would mean that Intel is not keeping up that pace, that 2%, as it continues to sell devices with, say, competitors NVIDIA and AMD. We don't know exactly how JPR does its math, the level of precision or the rounding and its numbers. Clearly, it's not exactly 0%, but suffice to say, JPR thinks it's at least below 1%. Now, this paints a grim picture for Intel's adoption, and at least part of that can be attributable to the fact that Intel has not yet launched Battle Mage. So it was really delayed with Arc, that, uh, with Alchemist originally, that worked for and against it, and mostly against it, I guess, but the reason for the delays became apparent when they launched it, which was massive driver problems. As we've talked about repeatedly, it has improved substantially since then. We did a one year later revisit not too long ago, uh, and it has improved. However, repeating the same delays and not launching Battle Mage sort of on the original schedule is going to stack Intel up against some very serious competition from NVIDIA, and we're starting to hear about AMD's 8000 series or whatever they call it stuff uh, in the pipeline. So they're going to be up against another hard fight rather than the outgoing generation stuff. Anyway, the point is Intel has to release new stuff if it wants to have any hope of gaining ground. 
The chart also shows AMD dropping from 17% to 12% share just after the new strategy of potentially skipping the high end to focus on the bulk of GPU purchases. We hope at least either Intel or AMD starts to gain share because it, this is actually at a very concerning point in history where NVIDIA is at 88% market share. And I mean, we're not like economist reporters. Uh, from a layperson perspective though, 88% seems like a lot, a kind of monopolistic. And that starts to become concerning because there is really nothing good that'll come from that type of domination in the market. It is scary levels of dominance. Uh, and I mean, we've all seen GPU and CPU prices over the years where when there's the fiercest competition, we get amazing value. And then when one starts to really pull away, it just gets kind of stupid. So um, definitely a little concerning there. But at the same time, it's not up to NVIDIA to slow down and be worse just to let the other two get some market share. They, they have to earn it. So challenging spot for Intel and AMD. All right, speaking of Intel GPUs, Twitter user BenchLeaks spotted what's believed to be a new Battle Mage card on Geekbench. The unspecified GPU, which carried a device name of Intel XE Graphics RI, or maybe R1, garnered an overall 97943 OpenCL score on the platform. This currently puts it slightly above Intel's A750 Arc GPU, which uses the Alchemist architecture and scored 96,106. For what it's worth, the score is also below the 4060, which scored uh, 101,908 in this particular test. If this is indeed an upcoming Battle Mage card, that score may change with further optimizations and more mature drivers. And the GPU is tested on a system using Intel's 13600K coupled with 32 gigabytes of memory. Now, uh, Geekbench is not the most representative benchmark, but it tends to be where a lot of leaks appear. So wouldn't take it to mean much of anything from a pure performance standpoint. The more interesting point is just that Battle Mage is maybe starting to appear in places, so maybe they'll ship it at some point. All right, up next, it's a good thing we published our fab tour before we had to change all instances and references of Intel to Qualcomm. Because the Wall Street Journal says that Qualcomm has allegedly been in talks to buy either Intel or maybe more realistically, parts of it. So currently, just to make sure everyone's clear on this, the source for this story is simply sources familiar with the matter. Now we. We've said that before too, because sometimes you just can't name your source, uh, even if you have multiple of them and you're pretty sure of it. So maybe it's valid, maybe it's not. Point is, there's no actual hard evidence for this presented in the story or anywhere else right now. So with that kind of important caveat stated, here's what the Wall Street Journal is reporting on. They say that the uh, quote, deal is far from certain and that an acquisition would face some hurdles. So Qualcomm is primarily known for its ARM-based processors and Intel is known for its x86 CPUs. This acquisition, if it were to happen, would definitely still raise antitrust concerns and queries, especially with the amount of money the US government is giving Intel lately. To curb this, the Wall Street Journal suggests that, quote, Qualcomm could intend to sell assets or parts of Intel to other buyers. Now, it really wouldn't be wild if Intel sold part of its business to Qualcomm or really anyone else. They have done this over the years. Intel is a massive intellectual property machine. It's like their, their chief thing they do is uh, accumulate intellectual property. They do a lot of engineering, design, development, acquisitions. So Intel has sold stuff off in the past. That wouldn't be unprecedented. Um, the company also has a number of valuable intellectual property uh, claims that it maybe isn't actively using or pursuing. So we'll see how that develops. But at its peak, just for some perspective, it used to be the most valuable chip company in the world. Compared to product level rival companies like AMD, Nvidia, Qualcomm, Intel has had a brutal 2024 thus far, with the company's stock dropping over 53% since January at the time of writing, from a high of $49.55 a share to $22.83, again, at the time of writing. The number on the screen will probably be a little bit different just because it changes literally all the time. Intel has also traded blows with TSMC and Samsung over the years, but in more recent years, it seems to have ceded much of its lead to TSMC. The company's market cap, as of writing this, is approximately $97.5 billion. That'll be slightly different again on the screen, but anywhere in that vicinity really seems like a drop in the bucket compared to companies like Nvidia, which now has a $2.97 trillion 
cap at the time of writing. Qualcomm, based in San Diego, has a market cap of $185.7 billion, plus or minus a bit. So it does seem unlikely that Qualcomm would buy the entirety of Intel, plus even if we just pretend that we're uh, instantly financially viable for Qualcomm, it would definitely face U.S. government regulation hurdles. Uh, antitrust queries, all that usual stuff with big acquisitions. So uh, anyway, who knows? If it becomes reality, um, I'm just happy that we published our fab tour, finally. Uh, it was a year in the making, and it would have been a lot of work to go back through and control F a video for the word Intel. It would just have this awkward voiceover. Like every 10 seconds, it'd be like, Qualcomm, and then back to the VO that we recorded before the acquisition. Anyway. Uh, we'll see. We'll, uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think Intel as a whole is going to be bought out. I don't know anything about this. I'm not a specialist in acquisitions. But uh, just looking at the way the U.S. government sort of treats Intel, uh, it does seem unlikely that there'd just be a total like, yep, we're Qualcomm now. Uh, so maybe parts of it. All right, next one. The 9950X3D, 9900X3D, and 9600X3D have some more rumors. We'll keep this really short because there's not much to it. But Benchlife is reporting that the 9950X3D and 9900X3D, which would be dual CCD parts, meaning that there are three total chiplets on the substrate. There's the IO die and two CCDs. Uh, the current rumor is that those may run vertical cache across both CCDs. Now, in all the solutions that are relevant right now, the V cache is run on a single CCD. And so depending on which one you're looking at, like the 7950X3D, for instance, there's some special setup parameters to make sure you get max performance out of it for scheduling uh, and, and sort of task assignment reasons on the Windows level. So moving to both CCDs having 3D cache would be a pretty big change. Additionally, Benchlife embedded a tweet from a Twitter user suggesting that the 9800X3D will ship in early November according to a leaker. Now, this aligns with rumors of Intel's Arrow Lake landing in October. So looks like it'll be a busy couple months. Uh, the Arrow Lake rumors have really been ramping up lately. I think a week or two ago, the newest reported launch date was October 24th. It's been moving around by a week, but looks like it's going to be in that range. So we'll be busy in the next month or so. Next one, we have a mix of leaks and rumors around AMD Zen 5-based APUs, codenamed Strix Halo. And the Z2 Extreme also in this roundup of leaks, presumably for the next ROG Ally, maybe the ROG Ally 2. So we just combined all these into one. Some of these are a little older, some are newer. These upcoming solutions follow the previous generation that had the 8840U in various laptops and handhelds, the Z1 Extreme, and devices like the ROG Ally. As a baseline, the Zen 5 solutions that actually exist or are otherwise confirmed are codenamed StrixPoint. These are the Ryzen AI 9 HX375 HX. 370, 365, as listed on AMD's official website. The currently highest end HX375 has 12 cores split into two clusters, four normal Zen 5 cores in one, eight Zen 5C cores in the other. For graphics, it's got 16 RDNA 3.5 CUs or compute units, which AMD dubs the Radeon 890M. Finally, there's an NPU or neural processing unit with a listed 55 tops of performance for AI tasks. Moving into the leaks, Strix Halo parts are claimed to be higher spec than Strix Point, according to a Weibull user named Golden Pig Upgrade Package, if you translate it. The poster writes this, quote, Strix Halo preliminary SKU planning, Ryzen AI Max 395, Ryzen AI Max 390, AI Max 385, lists those for the CU count and the core count, and then says up to 96 gigabytes of memory can be allocated as video memory. The 395 scaling up to 16 cores is interesting, assuming AMD keeps its mixed architecture design. The note about maximum memory allocation has implications for running larger generative AI models locally than is typically expected. Even if the actual performance is slower than something like a 4090, it may be acceptable for some workloads where you care more about being able to use more complex models without sprinting for insanely expensive or more fixed location, like non-moving workstation desktop GPUs. Regardless of the final specifications, these are looking like they'll be expensive compared to the previous uh, generation 
of solutions from AMD. An alleged member of the GPD team, just in this lineup of rumors, also posted something on Discord saying that the price of the HX370, strict point, not Halo, is more than two times higher than the uh, 8840U. Assuming that's true, it doesn't bode well for the pricing on the next generation of handhelds. To round the story out though, there's also a leak regarding the Z2 Extreme, purportedly going into the ROG Ally 2 and the Legion Go 2. According to a shipping manifest, EVT samples of a processor marked as Z2X28W have been shipped to India. The part number also shows up in AMD's official master list of products as mass market, so that's a good indication of it being real. It's also marked as having eight cores, which should be totally adequate for gaming workloads, particularly in a handheld where you're more likely limited by power budget anyway. Running extra CPU cores could take away from the efficiency uh, elsewhere, like the GPU cores. It'll all be about finding the balance, and that's what our testing will look at if and when these launch. We just got through a ton of rumors. So this block is going to be dedicated to just a bunch of news, just pure hard news. Uh, first up, Valve continues to pick up Steam with the digital platform reaching a new concurrent player peak that amounts to over 38 million users. Specifically, Steam reached 38,348,144 concurrent users, which surpasses the platform's all-time high of 37.2 million that was established just last month. Steam's really been on a roll since the release of Black Myth Wukong, which became the highest concurrent single-player game release on the platform and the second highest concurrently played game overall. Multiplayer games like Counter-Strike 2, Dota 2, and PUBG bolster those numbers, and Steam overall has continued to grow, especially with Ubisoft now coming crawling back to it with its own games. Next, Meta has officially unveiled its MetaQuest 3S. Its biggest selling point is the price. The price starts at $300, which is less than half of what officially the Quest 3 512 gigabyte model debuted at, although it's been closer to 500 recently. The 3S shares the same Snapdragon XR2 chip. The new 3S though is not as high resolution as the Quest 3 and instead runs at 1832 by 1920 resolution per eye. It also uses the older style Fresnel lenses as seen as the Quest 2. It's coming out October 15th and will also come with a copy of the upcoming game Batman Arkham Shadows. Another quick news, Thermal Take has released two new colors for its Tower 300 series cases. They include limestone and gravel sand, which the company is referring to as, uh, quote, autumn hues, because as we all know, limestone and gravel sand cease to exist outside of fall. It's actually, a lot of people don't know this, but that was the cause of the great limestone shortage of 1872. We didn't harvest enough of it before the fall. Thermal Take has been pursuing more color variety this year. When we visited them at Computex in uh, the summer, we saw that the company was experimenting with a lot of different case colors. They're planning to basically roll them out for short times and replace them as they go, see what's popular. Uh, it kind of makes sense because you can't keep all these on the shelves forever. So cool to see some variety. Next, Seasonic has released a massive 2200 watt power supply, the Prime PX2200. The power supply carries an 80 plus platinum certification and it uses a fully modular design, supports ATX 3.1, PCIe 5.1, features two native 12 volt 2x6 cables. It has eight pin to 12 volt 2x6 cables as well. The company highlights that the Prime PX2200 is geared to power the quote, AI revolution, which sounds like something Skynet would be into. The power supply is out now in China. It's set to launch at the end of September or October somewhere in Europe, and it won't be available in the US, at least officially. It'll require an outlet capable of 240 volt AC, and the power supply carries a retail price of 580 euros. Finally, MSI's X870E and X870 boards have received their official product pages. MSI goes heavy on the AI obsession and within just the first paragraph on the page, lists AI Boost, AI Land Manager, Frozer AI Cooling, and AI Engine. AI don't know what any of that means. MSI is advertising DDR5 9000 Plus support, doesn't say AI in that one, so that's nice. And that's on the X870E Godlike. The Godlike is shown with a lot of heat sinks and plates in case you want to go into battle or something. Lower down the page, MSI shows the X870E Godlike in more detail, noting 24 110 amp power stages 
with a plus two, plus one VRM setup. The MPG board is its X870E carbon Wi-Fi running 18 by 110 and a lot fewer metal appendages all over the board. They also announced the yellow and black Tomahawk X870 and the silver and black X870P Wi-Fi. All right, finally, uh, Intel has posted yet another blog post relating to its ongoing 13th and 14th gen CPU stability issues. We're reopening our testing on the CPUs now that Intel's saying it's this is definitely it this time uh, for the microcode. So now that it's gotten a little more mature, we're going to be rerunning all the testing for Intel CPUs. And uh, in the very least, it'll all be done for Arrow Lake, which is rumored to be next month. And hopefully we get something out sooner talking about some of the microcode changes. Until then, though, let's just take a look at what Intel wrote to set a baseline for expectation. So Intel wrote this, quote, Intel has localized the vmin shift instability issue to a clock tree circuit within the IA core, which is particularly vulnerable to reliability aging under elevated voltage and temperature. Intel has observed these conditions, can lead to a duty cycle shift of the clocks and observed system instability. Intel has identified four operating scenarios that can lead to vmin shift and affected processors. Uh, they list them, we'll give you the short version, but they say motherboard power delivery, ETVB, microcode algorithm, microcode SVID uh, algorithm requesting high voltages, microcode and BIOS code requesting elevated core voltages. And then they've got their mitigations for each of these listed. So Intel stated that the microcode 0x12b Will be shipping next that follows the prior 0125 update intel claims that there is no performance impact we'll validate that on our own and let you know intel also curiously claims that intel 13th and 14th gen mobile processors are unaffected by vmin shift instability and that is really curious maybe it's a different <laughs> instability issue but the amount of emails we've received from you all specifically about laptops in those generations with stability problems uh, seems contradictory to this statement. So we actually bought one of those. I spent like almost six grand on a laptop from a viewer that, I mean, it was actually what they paid. It's a really expensive laptop and the CPU is functionally dead. So it is a CPU level defect we've determined. And uh, anyway, that's a separate thing. Hopefully we can get it. We need it to work well enough that we can test some stuff. That's the only problem we have right now. Otherwise, it's a warranty unit for a different type of video. But anyway, uh, we'll look at that later. So at this time, that's the news from Intel. Regardless of whether this is the end of the road for the updates on this issue, it's probably not. You should still update your microcode. And for those of you who purchased through system integrators or pre-built, you should check with them if they have a custom board, uh, such as the Corsair 1 i500, which has a, a, a sort of variant of the MSI board that's in it to make sure you install the micro code updates for that as well, because this is going to be stuff that you need to try and preserve the CPUs. Now, Intel in the past for this issue specifically for these CPUs has stated recently that uh, these updates will not fix or remedy existing instability issues and that it will only help going forward. So you should still go through RMA channels if you're experiencing any instability issues at all. Um, it's a mixed bag. We've gotten a good amount of emails from people who say they had a great RMA experience. We've also gotten a lot of emails from people saying they've had a terrible RMA experience. So still reading through those and sort of filtering everything. It's a big story. It's very difficult to get a grasp on. But either way, we're going to be retesting all this in due time, especially for the Arrow Lake launch or the X3D launch or whatever hits next. Uh, we should have some new numbers for you all with the new microcode, and we'll try and run some comparisons, AB, new to old as well, and let you know what has changed. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, go to the store to grab one of these shirts and to support our factory documentary and educational series directly. It's got some really cool interviews and 3D animations in there as well. So thank you all for uh, trying out the video. Hopefully you like it, and uh, it's a fun format to learn some stuff. So that's it. We'll see you all next time.